Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to friends and colleagues from around the world. Welcome to this thematic forum that looks at nature-based solutions for resilience of infrastructure. Nature is an integral part of our lives. Take a moment to think about the happiness or the joy that you get when you walk in the park or trek through the forests. These very same nature-based solutions can also complement, replace, and safeguard infrastructure. In this session, we want to discuss the institutional mechanisms, the policies, the partnerships that can accelerate nature-based solutions for the resilience of infrastructure. It is my privilege to invite today's moderator, Mr. Tanaji Sen. Tanaji Sen is the Director for Advocacy and Partnerships at CDRI. He has engaged in humanitarian work and is a disaster resilience specialist with more than two decades of work experience. Prior to joining CDRI, he was also the CEO of Radar India. Over to you, Tanaji. Thank you so much, Shem. And again, good afternoon to all the colleagues here in the studio and good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all of you join, joining us virtually. I'm very pleased to moderate this multifaceted session on nature-based solutions. Today, we are joined by seven eminent experts working in NBS and infrastructure from across the world, who I am uh, delighted to introduce. We have Mr. Alexander Sasha Wiese, a banking and finance expert from UNEPFI. Ms. Aloka Mazundar, the Head of Corporate Sustainability at HSBC India. Ms. Anadel Kabanban, a Marine Biologist and Country Program Manager of Wetlands International Philippines. Dr. Chris Dickinson, Ecosystems Management Senior Specialist at Green Climate Fund. Dr. Franje Huimaya, or Franje Huimaya, sorry if I got that right, uh, wrong, correct the second time, great. Professor at uh, TU Delft. Dr. Dipankar Ghosh, Conservation Manager at World Wildlife Fund India. And finally, Dr. Mary Melnick, the Environmental Security and Resilience Division, Division Chief for USAID Asia Bureau. And it's my pleasure to actually invite Dr. Mary Melnick to make the agenda setting presentation for this afternoon. Over to you, Dr. Thank Melnick. You. Thank you very much, Tanaji, and a wonderful good day to all of you. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation to the CDRI for organizing this conference, and my thanks to conference organizers, expert fellow panelists. Uh, may we have the slides, please? Fabulous. Do we have slides? Very good. Thank you so much. So in the midst of far too many crises in the world today, I thank you too for joining us today to discuss hope and the importance of nature, a nature that is life-giving as well as life-saving. In keeping with the session's objective, I will focus on the way forward for the integration of nature-based solutions as vital public good for an effective, risk-informed transition of infrastructure, assets, and the systems. Next slide, please. As an overview, I will weave together the role of nature-based solutions and its value as a public good, people as change agents, institutional mechanisms necessary for transition, and an invitation for partnership among all of us. During the presentation, I'll ask you to kindly keep in mind three points. The first, the very importance of protecting ecosystems and nature. The second, data are increasing for informed decision-making for infrastructure planning, development, and construction. And third, much of the infrastructure is in the planning stage in Asia. So this gives us a great opportunity for a transition of infrastructure assets that is not only disaster resilient, but also climate and nature positive. Next slide, please. To start, let's take a quick look at the IUCN's definition of nature-based solutions. Essentially, we want to protect, manage, and restore ecosystems for the common good of all. All of us know that ecosystems provide the air we breathe, the water we drink, fertile land to farm, and climate benefits. 
These are our joint public goods. Next slide, please. During this panel discussion, we'll hear about the emerging recognition of natural infrastructures and how ecosystems protect built infrastructure. And I look very forward very much to hearing everyone's presentation. My main topic will be the need to protect and manage ecosystems in the face of increasing demand and construction of linear infrastructure, such as roads, rails, and transmission lines. A transition to disaster resilient infrastructure should include avoiding or mitigating environmental and social impacts, such as the next slide demonstrates, please. This, this road obviously will not, that is being constructed here on the side of a very sleep slope, will not be disaster resilient, but a disaster multiplier. Next slide, please. The variety of ecosystems are the watch gears of our planet, supporting ecosystem health and functioning before, during and after construction is fundamental to people's ability to adapt to climate change and or increase carbon stocks, as well as having the infrastructure itself be resilient and withstand extreme weather events. Next slide, please. Some of the data that I'm going to present comes from a USAID funded analysis called Building a Foundation for Linear Infrastructure. This work was carried out with the support of Perez Corporation, as well as the Center for Large Landscape Conservation based in Montana. Further information, as well as a variety of training modules can be found on the internet and we'll be very happy to share. Next slide. We're looking at a paved planet by 2050 with 25 million kilometers of new roads planned. Next slide. We're looking at projects in Asia alone of trillions and trillions of dollars. Next slide, please. Just for projects in Asia outside of India and China and the Lisa, the Lisa project found that there is proposed more than 81,000 kilometers of linear infrastructure. Much of this will go through or near areas of high biodiversity and the few remaining relatively intact ecosystems of Asia. Please note that two thirds of these are new routes with the rest being upgrades. This provides opportunities to transition to climate resilient and nature positive infrastructure. Next slide, please. Just as an example, I wanted to share with you data from the study led by Neil Carter, along with others. Nearly 24,000 kilometers of new roads will be built in tiger conservation landscapes by 2050. That is like building six new interstate highways from Boston to Seattle in the United States. Tigers have highways too and need connectivity, whereas roads are known to block their movements and that of their prey with risk of collisions if they try to cross the road. Next slide. So why is it that we care so much about these large animals? Well, data is also emerging on the importance of them in maintaining healthy ecosystems for carbon stocks and water quantity for climate resilience as only two examples of the many. These data strengthen the case for protecting the remaining ecosystems and the wildlife that they contain. Next slide, please. As noted in the little book of investing in nature by Global Canopy, Canopy biodiversity loss is a global economic risk, yet governments spend five to seven times more subsidies on activities which can be harmful to biodiversity and ecosystems than they do on conservation. Therefore, it is essential that the new linear infrastructure invest in conserving these ecosystems and wildlife. Next slide, please. Given that ecosystems and the biodiversity which they contain are public goods and the significant increase in planned infrastructure can directly harm these public goods, I have a few suggestions for a people-centered approach. As infrastructure is planned, cost-benefit analyses should transition to internalize historically externalized environmental costs. We should begin to recognize that what may appear to be financially profitable is not always economic for the public good. 
Transparency is also a very important mechanism for a people-centered approach so that the public is aware of the projects planned and that their input is sought and they are fully informed on the possible environmental and social impacts. Avoiding and mitigating these environmental impacts should be a, an explicit component of construction that carries through not only from the environment assessment to completion of the construction. Regarding social impacts, equity should be considered as to who is benefiting and who bears the costs. Next slide, please. So there are a few key areas of work that I would suggest. We can do this by strengthening legal frameworks for safeguards and improving their implementations by government, the financial sector, and the construction industry. Next slide, please. Now, it gives me great pleasure today and here and now to announce that USAID will be working in these key areas with the World Wildlife Fund and the Center for Large Landscape Conservation through a new project called Asia's Linear Infrastructure Safeguarding Nature, known as ALIGN. Its objectives are to strengthen policies and practices, increase partnerships and engagement, and support the development of capacity for ecosystem and wildlife-friendly infrastructure, which will have added benefits for disaster resilience. Next slide, please. Align will be working in India, Nepal, Mongolia, and Asia at a regional level with government agencies at all levels from national to local, the private sector, including finance, as noted previously, uh, construction, and civil society. And I, I believe you will hear more about a line from my colleague Deepankar Ghosh of WWF India. Next slide, please. Partnerships. We welcome partnering with you to strengthen safeguards and increase their implementation for disaster resilient infrastructure. and climate positive infrastructure through the ALIGN project. I also invite you to join USAID along with the Global Tiger Forum, the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Protection Program and UNDP to the next series of Big Cat Dialogues in a few months to further discuss these issues. I would like to conclude by reminding us all of the importance of conserving ecosystems as a part of the transition to disaster resilient infrastructure and that we have data that can contribute to these decisions, and we have the opportunity now, as much infrastructure is still in the planning stages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie, for your agenda setting presentation. And we have a round of claps from the audience. So very nice. Um, it, it was interesting how you brought out that for infrastructure development, we need to look at ecosystems health, both functioning before, during and after construction. And it is also fascinating to see the projections of investments and their interface with ecosystems, the challenges that they pose and the importance of forecasting um, what could be design solutions in consideration of biodiversity. Um, fascinatingly, what I saw is that how you drew it back to the regulatory frameworks um, and how they need to complement both environmental compliance and financial safeguards for investors. But importantly, the message was um, financial profitability needs to be balanced with public good. Um, so thank you so much and for drawing us back to what the session wants to focus on, which is that NBS is a means for people-centered residents of infrastructure. Um, that of course, the landscape of institutional mechanisms, policies and standards is evolving. Um, and finally, that this is not just one person's job or one institution's job. It's, it's about partnerships and collaborations. And with that, I would be able to move to the next part of the presentation, which involves two case study presentations. Uh, we'll begin, begin with Dr. Chris Dickinson, who will be presenting from the Green Climate Fund. Hello. Hi, can Chris. you hear me? Hi. We can hear you. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. It's now in the proper 
view mode. Okay, hello. So my name is Chris Dickinson, and I work as an ecosystems management specialist at the Green Climate Fund. I'm very happy to be here today to talk about uh, ecosystems. As uh, Mary said, um, it's very important for the fundamental well-being of the planet Earth, and also for us as well. And as we face the three sort of big crises at the moment, whether it's climate change, uh, biodiversity extinction, or human health ecosystems are fundamental for every part. And if we think about health, uh, I think um, one of the speakers mentioned also about mental health and well-being, about COVID and zoonotic diseases, and also perhaps with um, heat waves. I think India now is going through a heat wave, yeah? Uh, trees in cities are very important for the cooling effect, which they can uh, um, um, undertake. So it's very important. And I think 49% of the world's GDP is dependent to a certain extent on uh, um, ecosystems and the services of nature. So if we have all these, if we all understand these fundamental issues, why aren't we investing more in ecosystems and nature? Why is this? Well, um, I think some of the reasons are that they're public goods, uh, and not, it's hard to um, derive incomes from them. The ecosystems uh, in traditional banking sense, um, perhaps the ecosystem service values and natural capital, even though it supports 49% of the world's GDP, is often not quantified by countries into monetary um, terms. So we have a number of different um, barriers, but uh, I'm glad to see that um, USAID and other organizations like the Green Climate Fund are prioritizing uh, ecosystems into how we deal with uh, climate change and also disasters as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Green Climate Fund um, and what we're doing. So first of all, with the world's largest climate fund, we were set up following the Paris Agreement and we aimed at supporting developing countries um, in terms of climate change adaptation and mitigation. Uh, so far, we've funded about $10.2 billion of finance, uh, um, which actually it amounts to about 37 million if you include all the, um, the co-finance um, that also included. It's 192 projects, it's about 48% adaptation, 52% mitigation, and 70% of the funds have gone to the parity regions of the world, which is Africa, the least developed countries, and the SIDS. So we really are targeting uh, very climate vulnerable um, countries. And uh, India is also included. There are a number of um, um, direct access interest in India. I think there's two or three development banks that are accredited. And uh, if we are to upscale things like the linear uh, conservation um, program and actually integrate ecosystems into nature, we also need to start working with banks and try to find models that can be invest in investable. Uh, there might be something for colleagues in India to look at in the future as well. And um, so how do we work? We're country driven. So that means that everything we do is aligned with the national climate strategies or the national adaptation plans and comes from the government. It's very, very focused uh, on the needs of the country. Uh, we work as a partnership organization. So there's over 200 accredited entities and hundreds of delivery partners and um, entities that we work through uh, in the countries we uh, work in. We've got a range of financial instruments, which include grants, loans, equity, and guarantees. So we're able to use quite a lot of different uh, instruments. Although, as I say in the presentation later on, one of the problems that we have in ecosystems is that most of the activities we've been funding, I think about 80% are grant-based. So we are trying to diversify. Uh, last year, there was a very good um, um, equity fund that was designed to help protect coral reefs. Um, called the uh, Pegasus Coral Reef Fund. And uh, as you know, coral reefs are also very important for helping with reduce uh, storm, uh, storm damage, uh, sea level rise, and also to avert uh, other disasters. Uh, we have a, a target to have 50% adaptation, 50% uh, mitigation. We're almost there. I think it's 48, 52. And we're very able to do risk. Uh, risk taking. So this is one of the big things which is important for ecosystems is that it's seen as a risky investment uh, by some um, uh, some partners. Um, but when you look at the value of uh, ecosystems like mangroves, I think the Wetlands International lady will talk about mangroves today, um, or other coastal ecosystems or terrestrial um, 
the steep slopes, which may need to be forested to try to reduce the landslides. The values actually are quite, quite huge, quite enormous. Uh, we have eight uh, um, climate impact areas and um, in mitigation and adaptation. And we're particularly interested in the increased resilience of local people, health and food, infrastructure and the built environment and ecosystem services. And in some, in some uh, global climate funds like the Global Environmental Fund, ecosystems isn't actually um, a climate impact area on its own. It's actually something cross-cutting, the same as gender is and same as private sector is. So it's actually in the GF, it's regarded as a cross-cutting theme across all of the other different sectors. Uh, but in GF and the, the Green Climate Fund, it's regarded as a separate um, entity. Uh, so we've got 60 projects in ecosystems and ecosystem services, totaling over $1 million, covering, in terms of infrastructure, mangroves, reefs, upland forests, wetlands. So quite, quite a lot of different uh, variety of um, types of uh, intervention. Um, we've also produced some sector guides, which I think might be useful for uh, audience members to, um, to have a look at. We've got uh, eight sector guides. There's uh, one in water which I think is very important in terms of disaster uh, risk reduction. It also mentions in there about um, some ecosystem-based solutions for uh, flood control and also sponge cities. We have uh, forest and land use, agriculture, and the ecosystem one, which looks at uh, you know, um, terrestrial and coastal zone management solutions for um, climate change resilience. These have been translated now into Spanish and French. So they're gradually put on the website as they're translated. So they're in both English and the other two languages. I think this might be useful for audience members to have a look at. Uh, when we're looking at um, each of these sectors, we have what's known as a four-pronged approach, where we have, um, first of all, looking at transformational planning, looking at catalyzing climate innovations, mobilizing financing at scale, and then eventually we need to align the finance with national planning. Uh, national, both public and private sector. Um, as Mary said, talked about the first one, transformational planning and programming. This is, I think, very important for any type of uh, ecosystem type project. And perhaps this is the big intervention point where we can make a big difference, trying to integrate grey green infrastructure into traditional planning for a country, not just the afterthoughts, not just thinking afterwards uh, what to do with the destroyed mangroves, for example. I heard about a, a port in one Asian country recently that says um, the new port, new harbor, uh, during the construction, they have damaged quite a lot of mangroves. Um, the future of this will be, um, it will be quite vulnerable to sea level rise and sedimentation. So they will have to, at some point, to restore the mangroves and integrate that into the long-term uh, solution for this port. But it would make more sense to me if we can start to think about this from the beginning and to try to quantify the natural capital values, not just think it's something that should be thought of afterwards. Uh, we also need to try and think of innovation. Uh, this is a request from uh, many donors we have, donor countries, to really try and innovate and use different technological solutions. Some of the approaches we use, like mangrove restoration, may be and not innovative, but perhaps the way we finance it or the way it's integrated into the policy or the way it's monitored are the innovations. And looking at two sort of examples um, that I have today, one is um, a case study from, uh, from Gambia. It's uh, implemented by UNEP and happy to see we have a, a UNEP member on the, on the panel today. This is a really good project. It's working in a country where it's, they have 20% uh, of the country is subjected to annual floods. It's increasing with climate change. Um, it's causing a lot of problems for communities that live in these flood areas. And the idea is to really develop and maintain and enhance and restore ecosystems in, um, in the floodplain, in, and also in the coastal mangroves. And this goes about through um, building up, I think, 150 different small enterprises uh, in terms of forest restoration or getting income from restoring productive landscapes, looking at participatory planning, livelihood building, and uh, awareness raising. Um, but some of the problems you have with ecosystems compared to building gray infrastructure. 
sometimes it's not as easy. You see a lot of big programs around the world where they have ambitions to plant a trillion trees or a billion trees. And first, the first problem is where do you get the seedlings to plant these trillion trees? So many countries, like in, in Gambia, they had to start off with developing good seed stocks, um, developing community-based nurseries, and uh, in the future they'll have to build uh, in commercial nurseries to get the number of seedlings to really restore large areas that are being degraded. And then the second problem is survival. Planting trees is very easy, but making them grow so that they become trees is more difficult. Um, so the survival rates initially were quite quite low, and because when you're looking at green infrastructure, you have many different challenges. There's the challenge of fire, of people's livelihoods, of climate, of grazing. And even in Gambia, they had problems with hippos and uh, wildlife uh, destroying some of the planted mangroves. So you really need to really look at the different um, parts of a landscape, the agriculture, the forestry, the water, and the ecosystems. And eventually, this project will need to try and think of ways how to upscale to other parts of the country. And that's going to really involve thinking about using banks and developing commercial models. They have done a really good job here because they are working with lots of small micro businesses and community enterprises. So this one is a good example of a project that really does uh, have financial solutions for small enterprises. And the second one is a KFW project called the Blue Action Fund, which is in um, I can't remember exactly how many countries now, but it's in the um, Western Indian Ocean. And this is try looking at the coastal uh, resilience of local people uh, to try to uh, maintain, enhance, and sustainably use coastal coral reefs, seagrass, and mangroves. And this, again, also works with um, participatory planning, developing livelihood models, and um, protected areas. And when we talk about protected areas in marine areas, it's often sustainable use areas, areas that can be also used by communities. Maybe there are some areas where they have certain times of the year where they can't fish. This also enhances the, um, the food security of, of the coastal ecosystems as well. Uh, so this is another example of uh, using ecosystems to um, reduce floods and the effects from adverse weather impacts. And uh, talking about ways forward, what do we do next? And how can the GCF help? Well, we're open to partnerships with people and uh, with um, innovators. Um, the amount of money spent on nature is very small, considering that the amount that it provides to the global economy. We need to really um, build into public finances and private finances um, some you know, models that can be upscaled. And uh, GCF uses loans, guarantees, equity, and grants. Um, We've had some successful uh, projects that have been working with national banks, and this might be one way to try and upscale these micro enterprises rather than just focus on grants. And then when the project finishes, um, it's sometimes difficult to upscale. We need to think about ways to quantify natural capital. And uh, I think this is something really, really important. It's not just talking about it. We need uh, government planners and the Ministry of Finance to start quantifying these issues um, like and integrating this into planning. Um, and of course, the final thing is we need participation of communities and rights-based approaches. They are fundamental to any ecosystem um, solution and uh, uh, they must be involved in the planning and also benefits uh, from services and from the projects themselves. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you so much, Chris, for your presentation. Um, Again, very delighted to hear of the very structured and organized approach that GCF has to financing ecosystem projects and blending it with infrastructure. It's fascinating to note the four-pronged approach and the range of instruments that are available. But more fascinating was the fact that you've already taken the step of nearly attaining 50% for mitigation and 50% for adaptation, which is music to our ears. And um, while you still classify NBS uh, and ecosystems-based work under the category of risk taking and uh, that you're willing to invest in that risk but i'm sure as we go forward and the and the quantification of the value addition of nature-based solutions is um, strengthened this would no longer be seen hopefully as a risk taking uh, as a as an investment that would require risk taking protections um 
we will also have the opportunity to hear from Alexander later today, uh, later this afternoon on some of the innovations that they're doing. But for now, I invite um, Dr. Anadel Kabanban from the Wetland Institution to make a presentation, please. You are mute. Dr. Anadel, you yes. are on mute. Yes. Just share my screen. Please. Uh, share screen. Thank you. I'm Anadel Kabanban. I'm head of office of Wetlands International Philippines. Wetlands International safeguards wetlands for nature and for people. The context of our work in the Philippines is the Manila Bay Sustainable Development Master Plan. The north coast of Manila Bay is subsiding due to sub, sub, over extraction of groundwater for agriculture and domestic uses. As a consequence, the communities living along the coast suffer from coastal flooding and become worse, and this becomes worse during their foods. In addition, due to subsidence and other factors, among them degradation of mangrove forest, channelization of rivers, the coastline is eroding. As such, in the Manila Bay Sustainable Development Master Plan, the priority measure is limited to the current uses for aquaculture and coastal fisheries and the restoration of habitats under the integrated coastal zone management framework. With this priority measure, the urbanized areas behind the zone of sustainable use and restoration will be protected. This, this line here, this yellow line here is um, the sort of uh, boundary between the zone of restoration, this along the seaward side and the urbanized areas here behind the yellow line. With this priority measure, the urbanized areas behind the yellow line will become sustainable and the restoration will be are insured and we, we, we contribute to the, the protection and resiliency of the urbanized areas to economic expansion and climate change impacts. The Wetlands International continues to support the realization of the goals, the objectives, of the Manila Bay Sustainable Development Master Plan. Wetlands International focuses on the acceleration of the use of building with nature principles or approach to restore the coastal zone and build resilience in coastal cities in the north coast of Manila Bay. We have proposed and introduced this landscape approach to the various stakeholders and they're very acceptable. The proposition includes nature-based solutions in the subzones within the coastline. From the seaward side, this blue line here is a breakwater or a permeable dam that will protect the shoreline from storm surges and erosion. Restoring a hundred meter belt of mangroves, this green subzone here. And behind this green subzone, this uh, orange uh, brown zone, subzone for the application of adjacent mangrove aquaculture. And this line here, the imaginary, the rough location of the inland earthen dike will be an, another protective area, another protective layer for the protection of these urbanized areas. In the next few slides, I will describe each of these nature-based solutions. The permeable dam. The permeable dam is uh, made of branches of, of trees held together by bamboo, as you can see in this picture, and netting. 
it is built parallel to shore. It allows the water to pass through this barrier, is permeable, but traps sediments on this landward side, and as well as the propagules of mangroves. So in the long run, the landward side of the dam will accumulate sediments, build and restore mud floods, and contribute to the protection of the coastline from storm surges. Another nature-based solution is the mangrove belt. Mangrove forest restoration is a common but poorly implemented nature-based solution for the restoration of the coastline or the rehabilitation of the coastline. We propose the restoration of a 100 meter belt of mangroves with the right planting of uh, mangrove species on the right substrate. Otherwise, you'd lose a lot of trees to uh, deaths or morbidity of the trees. As the trees grow, erosion will slowly be reduced. And once the mangrove forest is restored, the force of the storm surges will be reduced as well. Another way to increase the mangrove cover is the adjacent or associated mangrove aquaculture practice. It uh, increases the forest cover by applying a replanting of mangroves along the waterway, parallel, what, parallel to the waterway, as you can see in this uh, uh, diagram, uh, this graphic. It, the, the mangrove that grows parallel to the waterway provides protection to the fish pond, clears water that enters the, the fish pond, and provide, provides prey items for the cultured species in the fish ponds. So it's a win-win solution for the fish farmer or the swim farmer, as well as conservationists who are interested in increasing mangrove forest cover. Another nature-based solution is the inland earthen dike. In addition to the three nature-based solutions that I have mentioned, to reduce the impact of coastal flooding, storm surges, and erosion, this fort protection will provide the urbanized areas behind from disaster, from a hundred, one in a hundred uh, year coastal flooding. What I have presented here is the conceptual plan for nature-based solution to restore the north coast of Manila Bay for the resilience of communities living in the coastal zone. While it takes time for natural processes to progress, it is the best solution in a subsiding coastal zone. Hard engineering infrastructure will not work. It will, <clears throat> it will uh, continue to be broken down, needs repair, and very expensive to maintain. It provides other benefits besides its primary intended purpose, that is to protect the coastline from erosion, reduce the risk to coastal flooding, or reduce the threat to storm surges. It uh, provides support to coastal fisheries, the mangrove forest that is, provides coastal support to fisheries. Intertidal mud flats also provide source of subsistence, uh, so subsistence rather, and even livelihood based on the shellfish living in the mud flats. Mud flats provide habitats also for shorebirds, residents, as well as the migratory species of birds that fly through the Philippines. The next steps now are to making this conceptual plan more understandable to stakeholders and to inspiring investment from both public and private sectors. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anadal. This that was fascinating to hear, and um, uh, the example and how that's being worked as both a complement and safeguard for uh, gray infrastructure. Uh, considering that we are uh, running a bit behind schedule already, I am going to not uh, ask you the question and hi highlight the fact that in both your case studies, in both the examples, both from Gambia and from um, Philippines, we hear of the interface between people, infrastructure, environment, and the need for an overall ecosystems approach to understand the benefits that accrue from looking at green and gray infrastructure being uh, invested on together. I'm going to move to the third part of the um, panel discussion and invite other panelists uh, in turn uh, to respond to some targeted questions. Uh, first and foremost, Dr. Huimaya, um, having heard the presentations and the fact that NBS is gaining considerable traction um, um, and there are national intentions and policies to bolster it, we've still not been able to transform it into targets and actions at a scale. So what do you reckon are, is required in, ter in terms of institutional mechanisms and policies and standards to change the narrative or in other words, strengthen the narrative and make it a mainstream option? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much also for inviting me uh, to this panel because I really enjoyed the, the, the presentations of my colleagues here in the panel. And it's also made me realize how important it is that you acknowledge that in the typical geographies, so how people um, over time uh, basically constructed their socio-economical systems on the landscape and how this natural system is giving and also taking uh, when it's vulnerable. I especially realized this coming from the Netherlands. I think you all have to really uh, understand that we are um, a very tiny country uh, fighting against water for centuries already. And therefore uh, also very, very um, re uh, reliant on uh, infrastructure at the moment, uh, protecting dikes and uh, other systems. So. You have to know that our uh, relationship between uh, well, the humans and the nature is a very strange one. We, you could consider that Dutch people have no idea what nature is, basically, because we, yeah, we've been reconstructed, reconstructing it over centuries now. So this, this attitude is, of course, met very much, um, uh, um, say, this, these typical geographies all over the world are all, all also shaping the policies and, and the institutions and the way you work. So coming from the Netherlands, I can, I can say that uh, for us, including nature-based solutions, in, for example, our uh, protective uh, infrastructure is very difficult and it will take still decades, I think, to be able to do this because yeah, there's this very, uh, well, there's, there's investment-wise a very high uh, 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 dependency on this. So we are, well, we're now in the middle of proposing and redesigning Delta's project to also see how uh, can you include, yeah, we have to include this natural uh, system again in the way we uh, live in this country, but yeah, how can we get nature back? So how can you really uh, so I, I was very interested because the first presentation was about the recovery of ecosystems, uh, of conserving of ecosystems and sort of reliving them. But there are also situations in the world where the ecosystems have really been lost and you really need to think about how can they be recovered again. And this really means another way of, uh, of policies and planning where you really try to uh, to well, first make a decision, how can we do things naturally and then uh, te technically. Um, so to your question, what it needs uh, institutional, I would say that uh, that it's, yeah, it, it, it really is a, a paradigm change where uh, pol people who make the policy are, policies are, are willing also to rely on other type of specialists, on other type of data, of other type of performances also of the infrastructure. And um, yeah, in that sense, uh, I think there, well, the presentations also showed a lot of uh, 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 chances for this. And if you only talk about say infrastructure in, in the cities, you can see that the changing, uh, uh, infra so the changing mobilities, for example, also a chance to do things differently. So I think that's, yeah, that, 
that what you say that that, that it's that the the trust and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, um, say the the to to dare to do things differently is holding back at the moment to really include this. So, but I can see that there are many uh, yeah ways to slowly transfer. And I think the most important advice is to really stay close to say the tradition in your specific country and really try to change this from inside out instead of adding new things, but basically, yeah, trying to invite the best specialist and from inside out change policies and institutions uh, towards this uh, target. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the response. And I mean, if, if I, if I were to draw the bit, the, the bit in your response about dare to do differently, dare to think differently and, you know, change, uh, policies and if I may now go to Ms. Aloka Majundar, if that were to happen, we often, I mean, we often hear that, you know, there isn't a business or market case for in integrating and accelerating NBS in infrastructure. Uh, if you were to have that daring or not have that, you know, uh, the, that transformational change that we're looking for, what do you think financial institutions can do or are doing to increase investments for or, for or on NBS and ecosystems when it comes to infrastructure? And how do we make it a public priority and good through private investments? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sen. Uh, I think with your permission, I'll just take a step back because, you know, we often uh, get asked these questions quite a bit in terms of, you know, why are financial institutions interested in it? And, you know, why does it bother us, etc.? So this is something that we always get asked. So I thought that I'll address that. Uh, it takes me back to the, uh, you know, the core uh, of, uh, of our strategy, which is I'm just taking HSBC and, of course, we'll talk about the financial institutions at large as well. Uh, but, you know, we, we basically, it, uh, the core strategy of net zero actually is driving the investments uh, when it comes to NBS. Um, uh, if you take, uh, you know, we all know that, you know, the Paris Agreement target is to be achieved. Every organization in the world will have to pay. So therefore, financial institutions will also have to play a big role in this. Now, when uh, as, as a global bank, I think uh, we are very clear that we want to support the global economy in the transition to net zero. And, and when we are talking about net zero, uh, it, we're looking at two things. We are looking at reducing emissions added to the atmosphere. Uh, while also increasing the amount taken out, uh, and and we think that you know achieving a balance, uh, achieving a balance that not only protects the planet, uh, but that builds a sustainable and thriving global economy. Now, coming to nature-based solutions, we are aware of the multiple benefits to nature and society, uh, but I think one of the benefits is of course sequestering and storing carbon, and uh, therefore it will play. It has a very very significant role to play in this path to net zero. Uh, and so, therefore, the mitigation potential of NBS is significant. Uh, in this context, I think the role of financial institutions assumes great significance because uh, the financial institutions assume the risk of companies uh, and, and can uh, exercise considerable influence uh, over investment and management decisions, uh, which could be brought into play for the benefit of the environment. Um, you know, as, as a financial institution, I think the most significant impact uh, we can play is that we can help our clients to th through this transition. I think that's going to be the biggest role that financial institutions will play. And when we see our clients, the clients will also have a massive role to play when it comes to NBS, because, you know, there are projects, uh, uh, we're talking about infrastructure today. Uh, if you say, when you're talking about any economy, uh, rapid urbanization, rapid growth would mean that there is going to be a fair amount of impact to uh, the nature-based, uh, the natural resources. And therefore, NBS considerations will have to be taken into account uh, while making decisions of financing uh, going forward. It is not going to be, it is not going to be uh, happen overnight, uh, but I think there is a huge amount of, um, uh, there is a huge amount of uh, you can see development which has already happened where the financial institutions across the world have started talking to their clients in terms of the impact it has uh, on, on uh, uh, infrastructure and therefore how do you take into account and build your projects accordingly. Uh, in fact, we believe that you know, it's going to create a huge amount of opportunity in the future. Financing and changing, right? I mean, uh, you know, your traditional financing, if you, the dialogue, in financial institutions across the world is how to how to become more sustainable. So we're looking at sustainable finance becoming our the 
the big driver in the coming year. So therefore, I think that's going to be very important. Uh, in terms of, you know, the compelling business case, I would say we are still at a stage where a lot of work is happening. I mean, uh, I would say there's a long way to go. But I think two, three things I just wanted to highlight. One is, of course, addressing and assessing risks is going to be very, very important. Uh, and I thought I'll share it with this, uh, with the audience that, uh, you know, this work in HSBC has happened quite some time back or for many years back. We started defining our sustainability risks into two brackets, environmental and social. And, and therefore, we, uh, in our project financing piece, so when we talk about project financing for a financial institution, that's your large infrastructure financing piece. And if I'm to look at project financing today, we have developed our own risks internally to ensure that uh, you know any project financing, if it has to pass, the relevant risks has to be uh, uh, you know um, cleared, and this is with the primary objective to safeguard the commercial risk of our customers, uh, as well as the credit risk for HSBC, as, and and of course the added reputational risk. That is what we are looking at. So so today when we are talking about our project financing, we have a risk. Which, which defines World Heritage and Ramsar wetlands, for example. And, and the purpose is to ensure that customers do not have unacceptable impacts on sites of special international significance, uh, such as Ramsar. And the risks are particularly high in forestry, agriculture, mining, energy, property, and infrastructure development services. So this is just, I'm giving an example. We have similar risk policies for forestry, uh, we have uh, risk policies for agricultural commodities. So a lot of work has gone through, and I think this is going to become more and more relevant in the coming years uh, for financial institutions to play a larger role. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll just um, mention about one more thing and hand over to you. The other is, I think, the um, requirement of data. I think data is going to play a very, very important role if you are to see more financing in this uh, space. And, uh, and therefore, there will also have to be a fair amount of investment in technology uh, to collect the relevant data for, for businesses to take the right uh, uh, decisions in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, the validity of the project, et cetera. So therefore, I think I'm just going to focus on these two uh, issues. Um, before I hand over, uh, Dr. Sen, just one more thing I wanted to say that you know, if, besides working uh, as a financial institution and on businesses, we are also, as HSBC, we believe that there is a huge amount of work that has to happen in innovation and in uh, scaling up of solutions in this space. And therefore, we are working with organizations like WWF and WRI with very large scale projects in India, uh, which are focused on landscape restoration and uh, wetland uh, restoration. Uh, and these solutions are designed in a manner which are going to have very, very significant impact in terms of how policies are drawn, uh, how uh, urban planning is done, et cetera. Uh, so therefore, and these are of course, long-term investments and that's something of course, happy to share with uh, the audience if they have interest uh, separately as well. Uh, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. I mean, that's, that's an interesting and wide ranging response. Um, but essentially what, you, what I hear from you is that there is that transition that is happening. There's that transformation that is happening. It's gonna take time. It's gonna need more technology more understanding of the risk, both financial and the environmental um, and the physical climate risks. We have to look at sustainable financing. We have to scale up to demonstrate value for a proposition of projects for financial institutions. Um, and that kind of leads me to the next question, which is, I mean, which is essentially that this is the ask that often comes to the um, civil society, multilateral institutions and uh, governments and those developing projects and working in the conservation and nature space that, you know, how do you develop bankable projects that complement NBS and infrastructure? So Dr. Dipankar goes from your experience at WWF in linear infrastructure projects. What role do you see uh, NBS uh, playing in fostering infrastructure resilience? Thank you, Dr. Sen, and uh, I'm privileged to be on this panel. Let me just share my screen quickly. Is it visible? Not yet, but it should be. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, 
If I start with the first presentation by Mary, she was talking about tigers need highways. And I'll go one step farther, is the tigers and elephants, they need connected landscapes. And what Aloka, who is um, also a great partner uh, between the HSBC and, and WWF, what we are working on nature-based solutions in two large landscapes. We are essentially talking about conservation landscapes. And what we have seen as a civil society organization is that the Ministry of Environment, Government of India has been championing the cause of um, linear infrastructure mitigation measures, there are guidelines. Uh, but very recently, even the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, they have come up with uh, these guidelines, which is on, on the slide now, uh, which also says that effort should be made to take roads outside protected areas or construct or expand roads outside protected areas. But how much of this is happening? And Dr. Sain, what you asked is that what is our experience? So there is this case study from Brahmaputra landscape. Uh, this is Northeast uh, India and within the state of Assam. We have a fairly large uh, elephant reserve, uh, which is called uh, Lumding Elephant Reserve, constituted by the Lumzing Lumding Reserve Forest, uh, home to about uh, 200 odd elephants, uh, which is a substantial population. And 200 elephants, as these are large mammals, would also need large space. Um, they would need um, areas to move. And if I borrow Mary's words again, is that they would need highways. Um, what happened when we got to know uh, about the NH54E? Uh, this was the national highway, which was cutting through the elephant highways. So one response to your question, Dr. Sain, is that timing of involvement is very important. Is that at what point of time, ecologists, financial institutions, think tanks, researchers, we are involving in getting a solution. That's what we want. So what we did was we got uh, bridge engineers, we got ecologists, and I think uh, somebody mentioned about data. Uh, we had data of elephant crossing points. So we presented those to the National Highways Authority and the government of Assam. And together we developed designs uh, for animal underpasses and overpasses for vehicles. These are the animal underpasses which are constructed. And here comes NBS, is that there are two parts to it. One is that construction of infrastructure. Um, I'm not getting into what would be a nature-based infrastructure construction, but I am talking about the ecological part of it is that if these infrastructures are constructed in a way which maintains natural vegetation, if these mitigation measures are constructed in a way that allows movement of large mammals in the event of climate disaster, in the event of an extreme climate event, then that helps in mitigation, that helps in strengthening resilience, how it happened. So once those mitigation structures were put in place by around 2018, we started putting camera traps and capturing pictures of what are, what's happening um, next to these infrastructure mitigation measures. The first thing when we uh, it got us elated and excited is that we found elephant dunks uh, next to some of those uh, underpasses. And then lo and behold, the government also worked, started working towards making the vegetation more natural because elephants would only cross through these infrastructure uh, mitigation measures or underpasses if they find, comfort, find it comfortable and safe. So what happened was that natural vegetation was promoted and you just leave that area fallow, leave that area as, as natural as possible and natural regeneration takes place. I think that's the principle of nature-based solution that we, we allow nature to regrow and restore. And then... These are the pictures that elephants started visiting the nearby areas and then elephant families, um, adults, matriarchs with calves, they started using. Look at this third photo. Even when there was light flooding happening, elephant calves started using these underpasses rather than taking the road uh, and crossing through the road aside. So what helped? I think some of these discussions with the developers, with the forest department, with the financial institutions that really helped. There were visits happening by NHI engineers and people from the finance department were also there where we suggested that let us funnel, let us create passages, safe passages for elephants so that they are not crossing through the road. They're using these underpasses. So I think that's what is most important. If we want to bring more functional connectivity, 
And if you want to maintain connectivity within these large landscapes, and especially from the context of India or any uh, Southeast Asian nation where large landscapes are uh, the, I would say the flagpoles for conservation, this is something that we need to work on. And my last point would be what worked here is that timely intervention that we tried to intervene at a critical point of time, whether it is de-risking financial uh, involvement or, or whether this is about um, bringing in nature-based solutions at a critical point when construction is just starting, everything kind of boils down to the time and our involvement. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thanks, thanks so much for those demonstrative pictures of, you know, of a, as you can hear from the eggs, applaud applause that you're getting of the, you know they really demonstrate how infrastructure and nature nature based solutions can complement and work together um alexander sasha uh, having heard all the presenters and all the perspectives and now that you you're based in unep fi um, and and the unep state of finance report nature report says that nbs attracts far less investment than climate finance it's only 40 and the private sector is only providing 14% of that finance and you come from the private sector. I don't want to put you in a spot, but still, um, this market imbalance offers an opportunity for private sector to pursue new sources of revenue, reap benefits, increase resilience, reduce costs. So one can go on and, but fundamentally, I want to hear from you on what would be effective approaches to reap the financial value of NBS. <coughs> uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, so from my perspective there, two ways or two, you know, two major aspects. We've been interviewing our member ba uh, members, banking members uh, towards the end of the last few, a year to see how they, you know, putting biodiversity and nature finance into their, into, into their strategy and the books of, uh, of work. And the, the message was relatively clear that, you know, the implementation is still focused on climate, not on nature. And if you introduce nature just an, as a separate topic into the strategy, this may be quite difficult. But if we start uh, moving nature, the nature topic, as a nexus between climate and nature, this might be relatively easy. Another point which, is, um, which I would like to mention is that we need to turn the di discussion on its head. So now if you speak about nature and NBS, everyone is speaking about risks and risk mitigation, and no one is speaking about opportunities. And from a, you know, from a banking point of view, if we can turn it on its head and show and create opportunities, which are investable, which, uh, which can generate uh, revenues for, for banking clients, for banks as well, this could be an opportunity um, to, uh, to inflow more private capital uh, directly into this area. So one, you know, one point, and this is, uh, this is where we're looking quite um, significantly into it, is uh, looking into all ecosystem services, subdividing them between bankable and not bankable, and see how we can extract, extract the bankability and monetization of the ecosystem services. And this is quite a major point. So, you know, sometimes it's relatively simple. So if we can move, for example, for just pure carbon credits into uh, something which is, uh, let's call them uh, enhanced or premium carbon credits, which incorporate biodiversity and nature related uh, aspects, this could be a, like the first step to move the needle towards uh, financing uh, nature-based solutions from the private sector. Um, but you know, it's not just the premium credits, there are other ecosystem services. And if you look across the globe, there are some countries who are already establishing, and I'm referring here to, to Spain, some uh, regions in Spain, they're establishing ecosystem services tax, which can, again, which can help to move the needle in order to, to get additional funding from the private sector into, uh, um, into this, in this space. And then we need to look into de-risking. So if, um, if you look, for example, into the Belize transaction, which is a bond buyback, but at the end, 
the the whole structure was made possible because there were several metrics of the risking on several levels. So you have uh, from the insurance industry, you had like an insurance uh, overlay of the transaction. Then you had some de-risking. And this is where, for example, GCF may come into place. And this is where, I guess, which is still untapped. You know, we can use the instruments and the funds available in order to de-risk, especially in the initial stage, the risks investments into nature and uh, into nature-based solutions. And then in the second step, we can put some kind of overlays from the insurance sector. And the insurance sector will play quite quite a key role, I guess, in the whole financing of NBS and ecosystem services, because the insurance sector is the sector who can evaluate financially the, the, the risk mitigation potential of NBS being implemented uh, in the region. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is like combination of these different aspects will help banks uh, like HSBC and others to invest more capital um, from, a, from a risk perspective, from, from an internal uh, management and perception perspective, to invest more capital into nature-based solutions. Thanks. Thanks, Sasha. That's, that's very interesting. So you're saying there's a range of options. You need to explore them. You need to deliberate on them. Try and spin the argument around and not talk of de-risking. Yes, there is a need to de-risk, but also talk of the value add and the revenue benefits that can accrue. Um, and then initiatives like GCF, uh, four-pronged approach, allow you to demonstrate and build the case. Uh, so essentially what we're hearing from all four of you is that, you know, that we, there is a projectized nature in which NBS is integrated into uh, infrastructure projects, but you know, there is a multi-purpose and multi-valued benefit that accrues from NBS and uh, infrastructure projects being complemented or supplemented by NBS, but that needs to be still valorized. So, and if I look at the panel and all of you here, I, I, I see the case needs to be made. I don't think this case, as you see, the case is being made for cooperation, multi-stakeholder engagement. So, but it, but from a more structured perspective, um, and I'll go first to you, Dr. Huimaya, what do you need, think needs to be done for um, intersectoral collaboration and institutional partnerships um, that enable NBS in infrastructure development? Um, I think that, uh, as I said before, it's quite important to, of course, have the right uh, partners with the right knowledge and the right interest there. And I think then the second step is also to really realize that nature-based solutions are not interpreted by everybody the same. If I talk to my hydraulic engineering colleague and I ask him what are for you nature-based solutions, he will say, or she, um, those are uh, solutions that will support my, uh, my um, goal to protect uh, this country from flooding. So it supports my hydraulic engineering goals. And if you ask me what are nature-based solutions, then for me, it's really uh, yeah, the, the opportunities you have to make your city more livable, uh, healthy and resilient. So you can see that we already both have a very different interpretation of what these nature-based solutions are. So I think that, um, that it is very, very important to acknowledge this. And in this sense, yeah, to really build relationships uh, uh, because if you know that someone else has another interpretation, you can, of course, come better together in, share, in making shared goals. Because I think that's ultimately uh, the most important thing that as a community, you want them. Huh? You, you, you see them as important and you see it as something that really uh, improves your resilience and quality of your city. And uh, yeah, this one thing gives the carry capacity and the, and, and the energy to also be able to implement them in the end and to get them financed and organized. Thank you. I, I will try and summarize all the points at the end, but now I'm going to invite um, uh, Aloka to again respond to the same thing. What do you think, in your opinion, needs to be done on collaborations and done better in collaborations to mainstream NBS? Uh, I think, Dr. Sen, what will be important, of course, is collaboration, but also collective action. I think is going to be 
key in this journey uh, if you have to make this happen i think another thing which is but uh, there is going to there has to be a joint effort because uh, this would require a change uh, in terms of uh, you know enhancing your awareness because i think across stakeholders when it comes to enhancing awareness upskilling mindset change uh, and and also understand uh, you know the role it will play in making changes to the way we do business i think that's going to be a very very critical uh, thing uh, the third thing i think from from purely from a financial institutions perspective i think when we are uh, looking at such transition i think we will have to consider the social aspect to to uh, to ensure that it is just and inclusive i think that's another thing and i think also in terms of the conversation that all of us are having in in all our respective organizations i think inject a sense of urgency i think is also important uh, so that we know that there is uh, no time to lose i think that's also going to be important thank you and if i can ask dr ghosh on the same i mean you just gave us an example of that but just at a if you if you were to take it to the macro level what do you think needs to be done um i'm hopeful and uh, a bit scared the figures which were shown by mary um, in her initial presentation that the kind of linear infrastructure development boom that we are going to see um i'm just worried is it do we have enough bandwidth between the ecologists scientists uh, financial institutions engineers we need to come together we need to identify these critical areas because if anything happens in these natural landscapes uh, if connectivity is broken then that's an irreparable irreversible condition so we just need to come together and i'm harping back on my point is that time is critical the point of from the time of planning to preparation of the detailed project report the dpr which we is popularly known as uh, to the implementation and designing stage we need to be together four groups scientists which can be ecologists sociologists um, planners then the developers then financial institutions and the decision makers at the apex body we need to be together we need to come to the drawing board and bring solutions thank you thank you dr ghosh and back to you sasha how do we all do it better <laughs> <laughs> i okay i think like from a financial point of view we need scalable projects and products so if you look for example there's there's certain examples which are already working quite well so if you look for example there on the rhino bond this is something which can be re- replicated in different areas with different outcome pairs across the globe we don't need just to focus on on rhino bonds we can expand it to other species we can expand it to other projects and we can um have uh, a really great um influence with this product, products and then if you look on on the um, on the sovereign level so for example if you take the the recent example of uh, chile's um, sustainability link bond which was linked to climate and if we link it not just to climate but we link it to uh, um to nature nature based uh, outcomes this could be an additional like another product innovation which could work quite well it which is scalable and from a product perspective this is something you know from a bank which is kind of a standard product slightly enhanced by additional feature but that instruments are standard but we need to work collaboratively and this is you know i think we have all the stakeholders here we need to work on the mrv process so measurement reporting and verification on the ground is hugely important and this is where we're lacking uh, especially on um, in 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 this bigger financial products so if you look into climate it's easy you look into greenhouse gas emissions you you measure them on different levels and it's relatively easy but if you start to look into uh, nature based solutions nature biodiversity then the complexity there's like additional level of complexity and um, i think they need a strong a strong collaboration between uh, organizations yeah, like unep um, universities uh, like to to delft startups 
which are operating in uh, in in these areas, and of course uh, WWF and others who are looking into it on the ground, and can say okay, this is robust metrics or not. Mm-hmm. And this is what we're we'll missing right now. And and at the end, there's uh, this there's there are a number of projects and products which can be implemented so far. So if even if you look into the Belize transaction and others, so that for nature swaps mm-hmm. are becoming a product which is quite uh, quite advanced right now and which can be implemented by different countries in order to. Uh, <clears throat> To, to make the, the, the cash flow or the, the, the financial flow from global north to global south and help with the twin crisis of, uh, of credit and uh, credit versus and nature, uh, nature problems. And this is, yeah, I think this is, these are possibilities which we need to, to further explore and to create um, Mainstream projects, uh, mainstream products out of it. So banks like HSBC and others, you know, for them it will be become something like business as usual, like issuing a vanilla bond, which no one said. You know, it's it's easy for, and it's not just the issuing the bond that you know within the bank there's a there's a huge operation and uh, admin system like from a risk compliance. Uh, legal perspective, which should be executed uh, in, a, in a simple and streamlined manner. And this is only possible if you have robust products, if you have robust frameworks and principles, and if you have a robust M- MRV system. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Visa. That's, that's very interesting. So um, I've heard different perspectives here. and. I'm going to go to Dr. Mary uh, Melnik, go back to her now to give her reflections on the session and the deliberations um, for a couple of minutes. But I mean, it's interesting to see that all of us are basically saying there is a need for collective action. There is a sense of urgency that has already crept in. We need to be able to upscale, but we need the right metrics to be able to provide the right products and financing solutions. And of course, different people have diverse interests and interpretations of what this is what NBS is. Um, so bringing it all together is important. And um, at the end, we're looking at all the core benefits that can accrue by f- working together. So with that, I hand back to Dr. Mary Melnick uh, for your reflections on the session. A um, couple of minutes, three minutes, and then we can come back to the entire panel for their final thoughts. Over to you, Dr. Melnick. Thank you very much, Dr. Sen. And, and likewise, I'd like to reiterate some of the points that you made just now and everyone else has made, that sense of urgency, the need for the recognition of the, the multiple benefits as well. I, I think what's really um, very good about this session and the synergies is that we're discussing all of the options and opportunities in financing as well as the fact that the banking sector is paying attention. And in fact, there was a Bloomberg article yesterday about the boom in environmental, social, and governance funding. So we do have vast opportunity. Um, I think, too, that there are some key points on day-to-day business, so to speak. I, I mean, we're talking about future opportunities in different bonds, financial products. That's great. But we, with the urgency, what is the day-to-day opportunity? And I think we've heard some of that. Uh, for example, Chris began with the need to align finance with national planning. National planning is happening today and now. DePunker also cautioned us with this construction boom. Things are happening today and now. And there are tools and instruments available, but the business as usual approach doesn't fully utilize them. And what are the tools? As I mentioned in, in my presentation, there are already existing regulations on environmental and social safeguards. A lot of what we talked about today are incentives, the financial innovations, um, at, yet how are the current tools and regulations more effectively used, enforced, ap- applied, enforced, and implemented? So, so we have an immediate start in our hand. And also, um, you know, just as amusing as a biologist and and a fellow human who cares about the planet. You you know, I think about this session and we're talking about 
uh, disaster resilient infrastructure. And traditionally, I think the, the person outside of this field would think, well, if you build a building, a skyscraper in an earthquake zone, you must comply with certain codes. And given the data and the knowledge that we have and that should be shared in governments about the public good, it seems as if you, if you have a big cat landscape that is at the headwaters of major rivers, whether it be the high mountains of Asia or even the tiger landscapes in central India, I've heard uh, 600 rivers in central India emanate from those tiger landscapes. And we know today in India, the pressing issue of high temperatures, drought, and reduction in water supplies. Why is that not considered a disaster in the same realm as an earthquake? And you need certain codes in your infrastructure project to make sure you are not increasing your risk for not only the physical infrastructure, but the people, right? Earthquake codes, you're not just protecting the building, you wanna prevent the deaths and deaths of people. So I, I just leave you with a little bit of a, that different thinking that we haven't touched upon today. Uh, but I, I also want to flag that these real challenges can be met. Um, Annadel, your, your plans for Manila Bay are, are tremendous. And Manila is one of the very first mega cities of the world and continues to grow. And, and certainly I think all of us, if I may speak for all of us, wish you much success in moving that plan forward from uh, a plan to actual implementation as well. And, and, and this too will require how we uh, change our own attitudes in valuing ecosystems and how we do business that environmental and social impact analyses are not just pieces of paper, but that they are read and continued to, to, to be used throughout the project and that we begin to build these wonderful partnerships um, with civil engineers and ecologists. And, and hopefully in the future, uh, you know, I look forward to bringing together these different constituencies and that construction managers and banks count the number of civil engineers in that budget, the same as they count the number of ecologists and the cost for camera traps within the budget and not outside the budget. And that this is a cost of doing business. So with that, I'll, I'll just uh, leave you with uh, my great thanks for this extraordinary session. And I look forward to continue to working with those on the panel as well as in the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malik. Um, we have one audience question here. And thanks very much for your thoughts. I would have loved to paraphrase that in a sentence, but we're out. We've got two audience questions here. So I'm going to take those two questions. We have, we've got eight minutes left in the session. Um, and uh, we'll try and wrap this up in the next 10, 12 minutes so that we not over don't overshoot. Over to you. I Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is John Carstensen. I'm from Mott McDonald and the international engineering company that actually delivers um, nature-based solutions to private and public sector uh, clients. I think also very much based on, on the, the last comment here, that we need to be clearer about the offer um, because we say we have a nature-based solution uh, we actually do not spend enough time on saying what is the problem we are trying to solve it's a nature-based solution to, to something not just if we go out to private sector clients and say we've got a great solution for you uh, they will say we would like you to hear what the problem is that we are trying to deal with that means that we need to spend much more effort on clearly understanding what the value added is of individual nature-based solutions what are they good for what can they achieve? How do they compare to each other? And we have actually developed that kind of decision making framework for our clients, both public sector um, and, and private sector clients. Uh, so I, I think that that part about actually understanding the commercial value is really, really important in uh, in this process. So we can come out and say, here is, like, what is your problem? Here is a solution. And what we can say with confidence is that this solution 
either works well with the infrastructure. I was really impressed with the elephant uh, uh, yes. underpasses, a great example of how it works with other things. And um, what is the value you're getting as, as a business, as a national entity, by investing in this particular solution? So, thank you. Thank you. So that's an observation and comment well noted indeed. To you, please. Thank you, Tanaji. Just quickly, um, yeah, sorry. natural assets provide various ecosystem services, which sustain life, which gives us protection, and so on and so forth. Now, today we only were looking at nature-based solutions in support of physical infrastructure, uh, the, 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 the coming together of both of them. But how about investing in na nature? So the forest, improving the quality of forest, so that they provide better sort of protection against floods. So can we start looking at nature as infrastructure, resilience infrastructure? So, so first of all, nomenclature. So if we start looking at forest or mangrove as resilience mm -hmm. infrastructure, then banks start planning around it that, okay, let's have investment plan for regeneration of ecosystems or restoration of ecosystems or improving quality of, of, the, of the ecosystems. So, and today we just, I mean, in the, in the end, I think the UNEP guy, the exactly, colleague yeah. was more or less hinting at it. Uh, we, we need to, it's time that CDRI or, and such institutions put resilience infrastructure equal to or even higher up in, on the priority uh, to the physical infrastructure. Thank you. I think it's the balance that we need to find truly. And indeed, indeed I think also Anadil's example is demonstrative of how you regenerate nature and you invest in that to provide protection as, as an infrastructure in itself um, and make the urban spaces more resilient um, to the risks that, that emanate in the environment. With two and a half minutes uh, remaining, I've got the production team giving me a warning here, but I'm going to go back to the panel and I'm going to invite, I was going to invite a single minute for all of you to reflect uh, on the session, but I'm going to give you 30 seconds now. Sorry. Uh, if you can go first up uh, to Chris, please. Okay. In 30 seconds, uh, it's very good to hear all the different ideas from the panel and also from the audience members just then. You made some very good points about uh, the need to make sure it's commercially viable. And uh, we look forward to working with partners uh, like uh, Sasha's suggestion about de risking working with banks, working with insurance to really upscale nature-based solutions for infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kavaman. He's still on mute. Still can't hear you. While we wait for you, Dr. Kawaman, can I, can I then jump to Aloka maybe? I'm just going by the screen now. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so Dr. Sen, I think I, my only thing is after hearing everyone is that there is an optimistic about this thing. I think, you know, the, what we did with energy many years back, uh, we've seen that how this has now become pretty mainstream. And I think NBS is something the, everybody is understanding. I think, of course, there has to be more dialogue, more uh, collaboration and collective action, as we spoke about. Uh, but I think it, it is more an imperative. And, and from a financial institution's perspective, I think there will be various kinds of finances available. will have to be made available for NBS-related solutions. Uh, and, uh, and I'm quite sure that this is going to uh, gain a lot of traction because this is more an imperative today. And, and, uh, and we also spoke about to inject the sense of urgency. And that's something I guess stakeholders like all of us will get together to uh, start that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. If I can invite Dr. Huimaya now, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I um, maybe also wanted to respond to the two nice uh, um, uh, comments from the audience because I absolutely agree that uh, nature-based solutions also already sounds like you already have something and you're finding the problem. Uh, uh, and um, which I think is also almost an engineering approach, but uh, I would say that the urgency of the problem is uh, very clear. The three, the climate, the biodiversity and the health issue. 
That's why uh, we've been uh, experimenting and also coining the term ecosystem participation. So as a more overall uh, setting the goal for a collaborative group where we say, well, instead of looking at nature, what it can do for us, we need to turn around and think, what can we do for nature? Because that will be then the most resilient way to uh, collaborate and participate with these uh, animals, plants that make us happy and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Himaya. Um, I'll go to Sasha first because we've been going to him always last. So, Sasha, back to you and then I'll come to Dr. Ghosh and then Anadel. No worries, no worries. I'm, uh, I'm okay being last. <clears throat> so, this was a great panel. I have to say, they had like all the, all the aspects and all the views from different uh, stakeholders. So, my key takeaway is we need to collaborate more. We need clear guidance and clear frameworks and clear understanding among the different players in the market. So everyone speaking about, uh, someone speaking about the nature-based solutions needs to have the same understanding across the different industries and, and sectors. And if we work collaboratively, then we can achieve. And I'll Thank stop you. Here. Thank you. Dr. Ghosh? Thank you. Um, two things. We need a multi-sectoral approach to address the problem that nature conservation is facing today. Finance is not the problem. Engineering solutions are not a problem. Nature-based solutions are not a problem. Those are there. We need the willingness of people, we need the willingness of decision makers that yes, we need to make this investment to protect nature and safeguard our environment. Thank you. Thank you. And back to you, Dr. Kavavan. Are you able to hear us? Are you suggesting? Yes. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Your closing the, thought. Uh, uh, I thank Mary for her good wishes for our success in the North coast of Manil Bay, it certainly is a gargantuan challenge. And, but it's a challenge that we have to face. And I think we can face it with collaboration, cooperation with both private and private public sectors. And as mentioned, also the financial sector is willing to support nature-based solutions globally. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, just to say, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to moderate this conversation. I'm going to try and close this uh, um, now um, and say that we witnessed a spectrum of perspectives which demonstrate the value proposition of NBS as the mainstream option potentially for building infrastructure of today and tomorrow. Um, the case studies demonstrate life examples of what's being done. Um, the panelists speak to the progress and vision that is required for financing, benchmarking, governance, and multi-stakeholder collaborative associations, bringing in the constituents, bringing in a shared language and lexicon and taxonomy of how we work, and importantly, stating what the problem is that we want to solve. Thank you for that. And um, essentially, we need to bring NBS to the fulcrum of how you design and think of infrastructure and the solutions and services it provides. Um, so thank you all of you again for joining us. I'll also take the opportunity to announce that there'll be a call for papers on our global flagship report. Please look out on our website. We are very happy to have all of these perspectives and experiences drawn out and uh, reflected in that report. Have a nice afternoon, have a nice evening, have a nice day, wherever you are um, all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. It's been Thank an you. honor. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.